we're going to do distress tolerance today, which is probably one of the most important topics that I will ever do. In fact, we may do a second one because... This is something that is, I see it in everything. Like when I'm doing therapy, I, I, it's, I'm at least thinking about distress tolerance in probably 80% of the sessions that I'm conducting. When I say distress tolerance, by the way, when you all are, you might be wondering what the hell is that? Distress tolerance is basically, I'm going to put it in very basic layman terms is how long you can hang in there with d being uncomfortable where you just, you feel uncomfortable either emotionally, physically as well. Like there's, there's physical distress tolerance also, but today I'm going to be mostly just talking about emotional distress, but there is something to be said for being able to hang in there with physical distress tolerance as well. And there may be some correlation between those two things, but if there is, I don't know it just to be fair. But it's just, it, that's all it is. How, how long can you hang in there with discomfort before you engage in some type of action that will try to get you away from it, basically? Or when does something, when, when does how you feel become actionable? And a lot of times people with very low distress tolerance will say, that they are more slave to compulsions than people who have very high distress tolerance because they are brought to something actionable a lot quicker because they can't tolerate how uncomfortable they are. Please know that when I'm talking about this, this is not one of those things where you say, here's where I fall on the spectrum, and then that's where you are, and you're doomed to be there for the rest of your life. You can build distress tolerance. And to some extent, I would actually make the argument that it is easier to build higher distress tolerance if you have low distress tolerance than it is to lower your distress tolerance if you have high distress tolerance. That is all, that's anecdotal. That doesn't really come from any research. So just also take that with a grain of salt. But certainly in my experience as a therapist, when we start working on distress tolerance, coming down and having more, less, distress tolerance or more sensitivity is, is I think harder than building distress tolerance. Most of us don't like feeling stressed out. Most of us don't like being uncomfortable. You always see me bitch and moan when I'm streaming about when it gets too hot in here or if it's too cold in here. We don't like being uncomfortable, and so we do things to try to make ourselves be more comfortable. And an example is, you know, air conditioning, right? Like we have air conditioners and furnaces and stuff like that so that we can be physically comfortable. And so emotionally, we don't often learn or talk about what that means to be uncomfortable and how to hang in there with that. There's a lot of ties here between this and learning. So if you were here for the learning theory, if you've watched that video, you're going to see some parallels in what I talk about here with learning theory, in part because people learn better with a higher level of distress tolerance too, because you have to be anxious to learn. I'm going to talk about this big time through a filter of anxiety, but just know that this is not only on anxiety, that this also relates to sadness, joy, really any emotion that you might experience is distressing. And yes, believe it or not, some people experience joy is distressing. First thing I want, I'm going to switch scenes here. The first thing that I want to make sure that I mention to all of you about this. So there's a difference between disliking distress and it being unbearable. And when we're talking about a person who has maybe an optimal level of distress tolerance, we're talking about somebody who may still dislike it, but can hang in there. Whereas if people are experiencing their emotional experiences utterly unbearable, then there's probably a low level of distress tolerance. And you might say that people who don't experience their emotions at all 
maybe have a particularly high amount of distress tolerance or a low amount that they've overcompensated for so that they don't have to feel it. Feel it. That gets really complicated. So there are some like common emotional experiences that people experience distress in. And so I'm going to share those with all of you so that we have some idea of kind of how that works before I talk about how to move through it and what it looks like and all of that fun stuff. So we often experience distress, emotional distress in the context of frustration, which we often experience like we're, we're aggravated or it happens when we can't seem to do a thing that we think we should be able to do. Frustration is really uh, quite loaded with judgment. So when we experience frustration, that's often a space where, we ex where we're experiencing some distress because people really do not like to feel frustration. Ambiguity is another time. Good, so I got it right. Ambiguity is another time where we often experience a level of distress, which is where something is maybe overly complicated or unclear or vague. Where essentially we we can't get a grasp on what's going on. So that's another area. Again, I'm just kind of laying a basic foundation. We'll get into this more in depth in a second here. Now, ambiguity is similar to uncertainty. But uncertainty is often more self-directed than ambiguity. I apologize for my horrible handwriting. Okay, so ambiguity is when something like is just in general vague. Uncertainty is where maybe something is clear but we are not certain about it. Does that make sense? And so we tend to sometimes experience distress when something is, it, we, it, sh it should be clear or it is clear, but we are uncertain about it or we are uncomfortable with it. Actually, you know what? I'm just going to write, I'm just going to write this. I'm just going to write judgment or shame because that's a state that oftentimes when we when we feel judged or when we are judging votes. judgment or shame causes us a lot or perceived judgment or shame now an important part of this for all of us to realize in the context of distress tolerance is that all of this is perception so Perceived frustration, perceived ambiguity, perceived uncertainty, perceived judgment or shame that and you, that we often create meaning of as the result of an emotional experience. All right. It's an important piece because when we start talking about how to work through distress tolerance, there's a lot of cognitive work that a person has to do in order to be able to hang in there and build the stress tolerance. Okay, so again, this is just laying just a little bit of a foundation for you to have some idea of when we experience these things as human beings, they cause a lot of distress for us. The other way that I'm going to explain this is I'm going to do another very, very quick discussion of when our expectations and our experiences don't align that 
also leads to distress or as it's more commonly talked about dissonance all right so when you have a certain expectation of a given situation and you have formulated that using whatever cognitive schema you have for what it is that's going on and then your experience of whatever that thing you were expecting does not align, you will experience dissonance, which your brain experiences as distress. So an example of this would be when you all popped in today and you came in to watch me, especially those of you that popped in at five o'clock, your expectation was that I'm going to be talking about distress tolerance and that I'm going to facilitate this conversation in a way that is hopefully accessible to you. At least I would imagine that you have some type of expectation that's in the realm of that. And then it could be that if you popped in here and then I'm talking about something completely different or I'm talking about it as like this super judgmental thing and I'm being a complete asshole to everybody in here, your experience all of a sudden wouldn't align with that expectation of me, of the lecture, of the topic, whatever it is, and then you're going to experience some level of distress. I came in the other day, Dr. McDidden, yeah, there you go. So that's another way to think about when times in which we experience distress. And that leads our brains to go into a, something called aversive arousal. And I'm not going to do too much on that because that's a whole other day for us to do again. Okay. So just again, setting the stage for how distress tolerance, like where distress tolerance comes in. And the more that we can have a higher level of distress tolerance, the more that we can hang in there with our experience and then make a decision about what to do. So I have a little exercise for us to consider before I start talking about the different consequences of distress tolerance. So I'm going to read a list to you guys. And when I read that list, everybody who's in here and who's listening, just silently to yourself, you don't have to write it in chat. You certainly can if you want, but you do not have to. I just want you to think for a second as truthfully to your experience as you can from what you know about yourself, whether your answer to this would be yes or no. Or maybe like kinda. Okay. So I'm going to read this list and just think to yourself while, while I do this. Okay. <clears throat> By the way, I'm pulling this list from the center for clinical interventions. This was not a list that was created by me just to be clear, get that out there. Okay. Ready? So just think to yourself. Be honest with yourself. No judgment. Nobody here needs to know. It's just you. All right. Feeling distressed or upset is unbearable to me. So when you feel distressed or when you're upset emotionally, do you experience that as being unbearable? Okay. Two. When I feel distressed or upset, all I can think about is how bad I feel. So when you're upset, do you become all consumed with how bad you feel? And it's okay if it's not a yes, no. It's okay if it's like sometimes or, or ish. It's not, it's not necessarily black and white. When I feel distressed or upset, all I can think about is how bad I feel. So that you're, the running narrative goes into a space of like, oh my God, this is all like... I'm so upset right now. Why am I so upset? That's kind of how that sounds sometimes. All right, another one. I can't handle feeling distressed or upset. I can't. Specific to that language, I can't handle this. Like if I made you distressed right now, would you say to yourself, I can't do this. I, can't, I cannot navigate this. Okay. Okay. My feelings of distress are so intense that they completely take over. 
that when I'm feeling distressed, it totally takes over. It washes over me and I'm just soaked in it. There is nothing worse than feeling distressed or upset. I can't think of anything worse than me feeling horrible. Here's another. Okay. That when you think on the wide spectrum of things that you might experience as being problematic when you feel like shit, that's something that's the worst one that you can think of. My feelings of distress or being upset when it happens are not acceptable to me. In other words, I'm not okay with how distressed I get. Or think about if you're in a time where you are distressed, is there a, is there a phrase that comes through your mind that sounds something like, this is not okay. I'm not cool. I'm anxious right now. I feel like shit. That's not cool. I'm not all right with that. Okay, I'll do anything to avoid feeling like shit. I'm going to use more layman's terms with this instead of clinical terms because I hate the clinical terminology that's used in these things. I'll do anything to avoid it. I will, do, I will engage in relationships in whatever way I have to. I will distract myself in whatever way I have to. I'll do anything I can to get away from it. Being distressed is always a major ordeal for me. It's a major deal. My feelings of distress or being upset scare me. I experience fear when I become distressed. I'll do anything to stop it when I'm distressed. Okay, two more. When I feel distressed or upset, I must do something about it immediately. Like I feel this immediate, like I need to handle this now. I can't, I, I, like, I feel like shit and this need, I need to deal with this now. When I feel distressed or upset, I cannot help but concentrate on how bad the distress actually feels. I cannot help but concentrate on it. So when you feel distressed, it's almost like you're compelled to pay attention to it. Like you don't have a choice. Again, no judgment on any of these answers, okay? If you answered yes to these... It is not a bad thing. This is just for you to have a sense of your own experience. Okay? So there's no, there's no bad or good or whatever. This is just for you to be able to have some sense of whatever your distress tolerance is. And this is something that I'm thinking of a lot when working with clients. Of You can see this embedded in the language in how people talk. If you find yourself using the word can't a lot, that's another thing for you to consider. Let's talk about how this works. I have a, okay, I was trying to think today about a visual representation that I could do of this. And <laughs> it was, it was a bit tough. And so I have one I'm going to try to use. We're going to see how it works. But the first thing that I want to show you is just the spectrum here. So distress tolerance lies on a spectrum. It's not something that people fall into a category on. Low distress tolerance being over here. High distress tolerance being over here. So if you are over here on the low end of the, well I'm going to I'm going to actually chunk this out into three three chunks.
It's kind of like the, the three little bears. This one's too cold. This one's too hot. This one's just right. So depending on where you fall, it's going to have different consequences for your, for your life and the way that you handle distress. So we're going to look at distress as being an input here. So in, distress gets injected into the, into the system. And then if you have a tendency to kind of hang out in low distress. So if you answered yes to a lot of the questions that I just gave, that's the other thing I should say. If you answered yes to a lot of the questions that I just asked you, there is a good chance that you probably fall somewhere in here. Again, not judging. It's just, it just is how it is. Okay. There's a good chance that you probably fall in here. If you found yourself saying no to a lot of these, to almost all of them, there's a good chance that you probably lie in here. However, healthy distress tolerance sits here. So some kind of healthy dose of sensitivity, but also ability to hang in there while distressed is going to do you some good. It's This is high tolerance, low sensitivity. This is low tolerance, high sensitivity. So if you fall towards here, you're probably somebody who's a bit more emotionally sensitive. You're sensitive to distress. You're sensitive to being uncomfortable. And here, you're probably somebody who has low sensitivity to distress and therefore a high tolerance for it. Optimum, optimum levels are here. This means that you are sensitive, but are also somewhat resilient. Like you could make the argument that resiliency resides here. Now granted, this can also be resilient and this can also be resilient, but healthy resilience sits here. So here's the chart that I'm going to draw to hopefully <laughs> sum this stuff up, okay? Or not sum it up, but to know the consequences of how this works. Ready for this? I want you to imagine that you are a cup. Hi, cups. You're a cup. And here's where this is a little bit tricky. So bear with me for a second. I hope that this is a useful way to explain this. You are a chalice. Hey, that works. You can be a chalice. You can be a cup, whatever you are. Imagine for a second that you are a cup. And actually, I'm going to draw a cylinder cup because I think visually it's easier. You're not cup heads yet. Your distress tolerance is the amount of air that's in the cup. <laughs> okay. So we're going to we're going to look at it this way. You've got style, brother. Pally, thank you very much for the sub. Okay. So we're going to fill your cup with sensitivity. So the water is sensitivity and the air is your tolerance. So those of you who fall in the range of lowish sensitivity to distress, high tolerance, this is you. Your cup is nice and filled with some water. Now, over here, we're going to have the giant pitcher of life. And the pitcher of life is ever full of water. 
In fact, it's got a ground source. Okay. So, your sensitivity, just bear with me here. Tolerance. Now, we're going to imagine actually this is the this is the <laughs> we're going to call this the crisis pitcher. It's even better. All right, so this pitcher is full of all sorts of crap. Crisis, stuff that's going to make you upset, like demon pitcher, okay? If you have a high distress tolerance, way more stress can be poured into this cup. So let's say... You experience anxiety because, I don't know, so let's say somebody cuts you off in the car. and You're driving in a car and somebody cuts you off. And that kind of just fills your cup here. You're not going to, you're not going to explode, right? It's going to be fine. And then eventually that water kind of evaporates. And then let's say you go to work. And your boss yells at you, and that makes you anxious. And that puts a lot more water in here. But it doesn't quite... Still doesn't quite do anything, right? Nothing, nothing spilling over the edges. You're good. Now, let's say you experience a significant... Let's say maybe even like a traumatic event... That is really, really, really a big crisis. You might have a very, very large capacity still to where that's going to be. You're going to be resilient to that. Or if you're a person who really falls high on the spectrum, you might have cut a hole in your glass. And so it doesn't matter how much you pour in this, it's just going to keep draining out the bottom. Which is where we fall into high distress tolerance not being particularly healthy. Because now all of a sudden, we're not experiencing our world. We are just shutting it down. So stuff kind of rolls rolls off of it, rolls off of us. And so the way that we might see this happen is, yeah, like a person may just become, well, actually, I'll write it down. That's a good. So a person may become apathetic, which means they don't care. A person may be numb. This person may be aloof. We're talking to some extent about an unhealthy level because this has now become a leaky glass to where you're not feeling anything because if you have if you start to shape this up to the point where this just pours straight down because your tolerance for this is so high, you're just blowing past sensitivity and it's just going straight out the drain now all of a sudden you're not experiencing the world and you may you may freeze or you may be the type of person that just things just bounce off you to the point where you just you're kind of you're just kind of going through the motions or another example of this might be you're in a really dangerous situation that overtly we would look at as being like you, you really you are in danger and a person will not recognize that they're in danger because they have not they're not sensitive to it that they very well could have a emotional response that is really important to have like, it's a really good idea to be anxious right now 
Dr. Mick, while you're looking out the window at a tornado coming at your building. And if I don't experience that anxiety really at all, I may stay in my building. Or if like, if you're in Florida and you were just experiencing the hurricane and you didn't get anxious by that at all, like you may stay there and put yourself in danger as the result of having too high of a distress tolerance. So that would be another real life example. By the way, it's good to see you, Jennifer. Okay, so just because you have really, really, really high distress tolerance does not necessarily mean that you're, if things are going to be healthy. Because you'll hang in there longer than you should. There's a threshold where that's all of a sudden not good. Right? I mean, think about the metaphor of the glass. If the, if the water just spills out of this constantly and this hole is gaping enough that there's no bottom to it, that's not a functional glass. The glass has to be able to hold some sensitivity. Hey, you're going to love this. MXCNQT, thank you for the follow. I appreciate that. Welcome in. So this is not healthy. And sometimes people think that this is, and we learn things to make this so that we basically are numb and apathetic and we don't care or whatever. And boosh, it all goes out. It's not a useful glass. It's a leaky glass. And so if this isn't a crisis picture, here's, here's kind of what can happen with emotions is if all of a sudden this is the... This is the joy picture. And we go and we have a joyful instance to throw it into that. Going right out of the glass. So the thing that's always important to understand about the way that emotions work is that you cannot selectively numb them. You cannot numb sadness and experience happiness. You cannot numb anxiety and experience joy. You cannot numb embarrassment and experience elation. Like if you numb your emotions, you numb all of them. And so if you put a if you got a big giant hole in your glass because there's just no room for sensitivity and you just want it to go right out the bottom, then that means that if somebody tries to pour joy, if something pours joy, or if it's a moment where maybe you need to be sensitive to the case of like, this is something that I'm really proud. Like this is something I should be really proud of. And you can't do it because you're, there's no sensitivity to your emotions. So this is something where it's not healthy. Now, conversely, if you're a person with very high sensitivity, like, let's say, you know I, what I should have done? I should have used ice as the example. That's what I should have done. I should have used ice. That's what we're going to do. I just thought of that. So if you're a person with high sensitivity, so you got lots of, lots of cubes in here. When we go to pour from the crisis pitcher, so let's say this cup's already this high and you are, you have a very low tolerance and we pour anxiety into that. What's going to happen? It's going to spill over the sides. It's going to make a big old mess. Ah, it's going to be crazy, right? It's going to be a disaster. I don't know how much I like this metaphor, but whatever. Basically, what we're talking about, if you're somebody who has very low distress tolerance, is what you're going to do is you're going to try to get the hell away from it. You may pull the cup away. You may not allow anybody to pour anything into it. If you've got low distress tolerance, you probably are a person who seeks a lot of reassurance. You are probably a person who experiences like pretty intense physiological symptoms so you may cry 
you may avoid, you may dysregulate. Yeah, low distress tolerance is you just turn your cup upside down and then all this water just splashes everywhere. Nothing holds. There's only the tiny, the tiny, tiny, tiny little indent on the bottom of the cup that can hold just a tiny little bit. Yeah, you might avoid things. Absolutely. It's going to be pretty miserable. Pretty miserable experience. Okay. So, I'm now going to let's so all right, you guys get you guys get it. You get how it works, right? So a healthy amount of distress tolerance is going to be the ability to be sensitive and to be able to fill your cup but also the ability to recognize when you have to pull the cup away or when you have to drink from the cup or whatever so that you can keep the cup regulated and filled hey, so that it's useful as a love cup. This. Here's what happens. There's an event that happens. You might even say a crisis. That happens. This is just objectively this happens. This then happens to us, and then we have an emotional experience of that. Embedded within this, by the way, are our expectations. Our expectations sit here of the event. If that doesn't work, emotional experience, if that aligns, we're generally going to be fine. But... What happens is you have an emotional experience. And then this is the moment where you either experience that as okay or as distressing. Now, both of these, this is a quicker pathway generally to... Okay, so if we have an emotional experience that we say, this is fine. Basically, our experience aligns with the expectations. We're good. We're okay. We don't experience it as distressing. Then we have thoughts that we create and we make meaning out of that situation. And then we move to action. Where we're really going to focus in here is at the top of this tree. So you have an emotional experience that you experience as distressing. Your ability to tolerate this distress is going to make a huge difference on the way in which you are able to move to this space. Or I should actually say that your ability to go here and then down this path. So healthy distress tolerance is going to take you here. Now, if you have, and I would, argue, I would argue that high distress tolerance probably has more of a likelihood to take you here. Now, if you have low distress tolerance, what's probably going to happen is you are going to probably skip thoughts and then you're going to go to you're going to go to a bad action. And all that's going to do generally is in the long term, it's going to compound this and it's going to compound this. People with low distress tolerance tend to go straight to whatever it is that they're going to need, that they feel like they need to do in order to get out of feeling the distress because they don't want to hang in there with it. And we learn ways to be able to do this. So our responses with, with low distress tolerance are things that we learn. And one of the things that I that so what are the bad what are the bad actions? Avoidance is the big one. One of the reasons that this often happens is because we place judgment on the emotional experience. Your emotional experience just is. I know I say this all all the time, but your emotional experience just is what it is. We are who qualify our emotional experience as being bad or good. We decide whether what we are emotionally experiencing is okay or not okay. But what you experience is here no matter what. Like whether you want to pay attention to it, whether you want to avoid it, whether you want to 
whatever you want to do with it, it's there. Whether you want to tell people it's not, you feel how you feel. That's just what hey, it is. You're going to love And so this. part of our ability to build the stress tolerance and our ability to handle these things in a really healthy way is to be more intentional about this process, which is what we're going to talk about here in a second. There's a type of avoidance that's called, ooh, I don't want to write that in green. There's a type of avoidance that's called situational avoidance. Situational avoidance is where we try to stay far, far, far away from anything we think is going to cause us distress. So it's kind of like a priori avoidance. It's also when we start to experience the emotion and we experience it as distressing, we immediately try to get away from it. Yeah, so do you avoid, do you avoid dinners? Do you avoid holidays? Do you avoid, you know, like if you're me, do you avoid needles? Do you avoid water you can't see the bottom of? Do you avoid confrontation? Do you avoid just, I mean, to some extent, do you avoid distress? So if you get extra, if you get distressed by homework, for example, you don't go, you don't do, maybe you don't do your homework. You don't attend to it. Phobias kind of fall into this to some extent. I mean, sometimes you'll, you'll see it where people will react to discomfort almost as if it's a phobia and they will avoid. Avoidance is not good because what it does is it's a very short term relief that causes long term problems. The more you avoid anxiety, for example, the louder it gets. Reassurance seeking. And I'm going to make the argument that excessive is where this is an issue. If you are a person who excessively looks to others in order to make yourself feel better for whatever it is that you're experiencing, that is generally not good either because there's a lack of self-soothing there. Right? And there's an argument to be made that when you're avoid when you are avoiding something, you are basically trying to, there's, there's a control fallacy that sits within avoidance. The idea of that being that I can control the things that are distressing to me by staying away from them. But what that may, what that does, what avoidance does is it gives power to the thing that you're avoiding because it becomes a foregone conclusion that if I, I am avoiding this thing because it will elicit an emotional response. Does that make sense? That's like a really important point. If you're avoiding, you have already decided that that thing is going to be all consuming or overly take over your emotional experience or run off the rails and it's going to be horrible. You've already decided that that's what's going to happen when you avoid. And so it's a self-fulfilling prophecy because you're staying away from the thing and that's been that's been decided. And it's one of the things that we talk about with phobias, which is if I have a needle phobia and I've constructed all these crazy cognitions based on a really intense emotional experience that I have with it, and then I avoid it, I'm avoiding it because I've already decided that this thing is unbearable to me. As opposed to being able to imagine a world in which I could get a vaccination and not experience that as unbearable, that I could actually experience that as something that is okay and safe and not threatening at all. So in my low distress tolerance, now I have preemptive low tolerance for this thing. And so now I'm trying to basically stonewall it by avoiding it. And it caused all that does is just, it crystallizes how anxiety provoking that thing is. And what it does is it also holds my low distress tolerance for working for handling needles in place. I'm not doing the work on the distress tolerance that I have in the context of a phobia because I've already decided that that thing has power over me. And so a lot of working through distress tolerance is really trying to help people see that they are empowered to make decisions and to engage in cognitions that they're going to find to be helpful. The idea that if I need other people to tell me that this is not distressing, which basically says that this thing is distressing so long as nobody is telling me that it isn't. And if you are excessively engaging in reassurance seeking, there's two things that happen. One is 
you are now putting your reassurance and your soothing in the hands of others, which is fleeting. Humans have their own agenda. Humans are like, we care about number one and we really do like, we just have our own thing that we're trying to figure out. And so sometimes people just are inherently not going to have time or energy to reassure you, or they're not going to know that they need to reassure you in order for you to feel better. And so that becomes fleeting. So now all of a sudden, if you are experiencing something as distressing or you're preemptively thinking something's going to be distressing and you don't have reassurance around you or the people that you experience as being reassuring, you can't seek them out, you're going to dysregulate because now all of a sudden this thing is you've already decided is distressing because now nobody's here to reassure you that it isn't. This happens with anxiety a lot. This happens with self-esteem a lot. This happens with insecurity a lot. One of the areas where you see this really commonly with reassurance seeking is when people are afraid that a partner is going to cheat on them. And what often happens is when a person experiences the cheating or like, so let's say um, something happens, like, I don't know, something happens, your significant other goes out with a friend and you have an emotional experience of that. Say it makes you anxious that your significant other went out with a friend that you don't really know very well. Totally okay. You can be anxious about that. However, if that becomes really distressing, you may start engaging in reassurance seeking, which is basically the person who's constantly pursuing their significant other in the absence of data that is saying, are you cheating on me? I'm worried you're cheating on me. Can you please reassure me that I'm the only person in your life? Are you cheating on me? Are you cheating on me? I'm really, I'm worried you're cheating on me. And they're constantly seeking reassurance from that person to tell them, no, I'm not thinking that it's going to make their anxiety feel better, but it isn't because this is all about anxiety. You it's not so much up, about the dude. cheating. Good. And so you keep doing that. People get really tired of having to constantly reassure somebody else. People have their threshold for that where they get so tired of being like, you know what? I'm sick and tired of having to reassure you on this. Reassure yourself. And sometimes if that person can't regulate it and their distress tolerance continues to be very low as it relates to that anxiety or insecurity, a lot of times the person inevitably cheats because they're like, you know what? I need, I, like, I'm not doing this. I'm tired of your reassurance or they break up with them. And then that becomes another self-fulfilling prophecy that <clears throat> this was doomed to happen. So that's why reassurance is not excessive reassurance seeking, not helpful. Intermittent reassurance seeking like is fine. And honestly, when working with couples, one of the things that I say to couples a lot is reassure each other up front. Don't try to fish it out of each other. Just every once in a while, reassure your partner. Every once in a while, send them a text that says, I love you. Every once in a while, you, you take them out on date night to show them that you care. Like do that as opposed to trying to yank it out of somebody constantly or take ownership of your emotional experience instead. All right. But we'll talk about that in a minute. Another example of bad actions that can happen is sometimes people will turn to, sometimes people will turn to substances. They'll use like alcohol or drugs or whatever to try to calm themselves down. Example of this is with social anxiety. A lot of times people will say they need to drink in order to be able to engage socially because it kind of buffers their distress tolerance. Self-harm. Yep. Certainly another example of this. I feel the pain. I feel emotion, so much emotional pain that I have to, I have to use physical pain as a way to try to like, so I can feel that or so I can get it out. That would be another example of it. Absolutely. And really what's happening in here, just so you, just as a way to kind of bridge this together for you guys, is, is generally what's, what we're trying to do is have some control. A lot of times people with low distress tolerance see this emotional experience as being completely out of their control, which it is. We don't control our emotional experience. But what happens is, I was actually... I was having a conversation about this in therapy at one point this week. What happens is because we experience, if you, if you have low distress tolerance, what's going to happen is if you experience your emotional experiences being out of your control, 
and that becomes your guiding principle on it, then a lot of times what happens is people then don't selectively look at the cognitions and the actions that happen as a result. And so what they'll do is they'll say, well, I didn't have control over being angry, so I didn't have control over the fact that I punched a hole in the wall. That happened because I was angry. That's generally what people will say. Something like that. I don't know. I, that's just a random example. Say, that happened because I was angry. And I will always come back in that moment and say, no, uh, you were angry. Yes, you sure were. That's okay. You made a decision to punch the wall. And because you see your emotional experience as being out of your control, you see the consequence, you see the output as not being in your control, but that is not true. The thing that we control as human beings is what we say to ourselves and how we act, particularly how we act. Even if you have intrusive thoughts, those thoughts are yours. Even if they might not sound like you or if they sound like some, like a parent or something like that, ultimately it's still your voice. Like or it is it's in your brain. They are yours. They just may not sound like it. Your actions are your actions. Your anger didn't make you punch a wall. Your sadness didn't make you shut everybody in your life out. <clears throat> your anxiety didn't make you ask your partner 10 times over the last week whether they're cheating on you. You decided to do that. And the reason that that felt compulsive is because you experienced this as out of your control, have a very low distress tolerance, and as a result, you see this as being out of your control as well. Like if you really take a second and you really think about this stuff, like it's, it's amazing. Like that's the, and that's the whole point of this. Like when I talk in a second here about what the things that you do to build the stress tolerance, like it's be, so that you can empower yourself in the moment to see yourself as having agency over what you do and how you handle something, no matter what you're feeling. And the higher you can build your distress tolerance to be, the better. But the consequence is, is if, you're, if your distress tolerance is too high, then you don't know what emotion you are operating in the context of. So if you experience, if you are like way too high on your distress tolerance, what's going to happen is you're still going to have an emotional experience. You are still going to be angry, but if you are not sensitive to it, if you don't pay attention to it, it's still there and you're going to have an output here. You're just not, you just don't realize it. You, you're not going to connect the choice of how you handled it to the fact that you were experiencing anger. This is something that particularly men experience a lot of, which is they'll like lash out and they'll act out and they'll, they'll kind of be assholes and they'll be like, well, I don't know why. Like, I'm fine. I don't, I don't feel anything. It's fine. It's like, no, you're angry, dude. And that's fine. Or you're sad or you're hurt. There's nothing wrong with that. But you won't even allow yourself to connect with that. You're not even sensitive to it. You're not even paying attention to your emotional experience. Or you don't, or you for so long, you've learned not to attend to your emotional experience that you just, you can't connect to it anymore. You've learned how to avoid that so deeply and so heavily that you now just, now you are in the exact same camp as a person with low emotional distress tolerance, where all of your actions feel like compulsions and you just can't connect them to why the other person can connect them to why. But in both instances, you're trying to help. I'm trying to help a person see the agency that they have for the way that they talk to themselves, the meaning they make out of what's going on and to their actions. You can tell how deeply I care about this. <laughs> True. But like, this is, it's truly, this is why I say this is one of the most important skills that you, that a, that a person can learn. One of the most important things that you can see. We are, this is, this is jammed into our heads, particularly in the United States, but I think in some cases throughout the world, it's jammed into our heads that somehow our emotions are the things that are controllable. 
And then we zoom into that. And that's, it's just, that's not it. Like you have a mo, it doesn't matter. Like I've had people sit, sit in my therapy room and say, well, you know, but I don't, I don't want to be angry. I don't want to be sad. And I have to look at them and I, and I say every time, but you are. And that's okay. It doesn't matter that you don't want to be. Well, I mean, it matters, but it doesn't matter to your emotions. If it was that easy, all you'd have to do is say to yourself, okay, I don't want to be mad. And then it would go away. It doesn't work that way. You're mad, whether you want to be or not, you're angry right now. And that's fine. And we really need to sit for a second and pay attention to that. And then we really need to figure out what you want to do as a result. The other word I'm going to write here is escape. These are basically forms of trying to escape our emotional experience. We want to get out. And the metaphor that I use for this is when we talk about phobias, there's a common, the common one that we talk about is claustrophobia. And if you're doing an exposure hierarchy with somebody who has claustrophobia, usually the very end of the exposure hierarchy, which is a long process, you do not do this right away, but the very end of the exposure hierarchy is generally that the person with claustrophobia has to be locked in a claustrophobic space. Okay, so just imagine for a second, okay, because working with phobias is very similar to building distress tolerance. So the event happens and the person has an emotional experience of being locked in that closet, likely anxiety or fear. And that person is very likely going to want to escape that moment. However, they're going to have to engage in an experience that they've learned through being in therapy and through going through other sides of the exposure hierarchy, that they've got to hang in there and engage in this type of process and then make a decision about what to do. And that decision being in that space, I need to stay in here. The absolute worst possible thing a therapist in that moment could do for the person who is in the closet doing the last part of their exposure hierarchy for claustrophobia, the worst person that the worst thing that that therapist could do is let them out. Which I know is like, holy shit, are you serious? You'd, you'd make them stay in the closet? Yes. Because they have to see that they can be okay. That that is not an inherently dangerous situation. You have to build that distress tolerance. The way you do that ethically, Jinx, is a person knows that going into that, that they're probably going to experience the anxiety. In exposure hierarchy, there were probably like 15 steps before they were locked into the, before they were locked in the closet. You, that's why I say you never would do that up front. You, it is not, and that is a, such a fallacy about the way that exposures work. You do not just immediately push the person into the thing they're afraid of. You work your way up to it. So by that point, that person would be prepared for that. They would still experience anxiety, but they would be prepared for that. But yes, you would hang in there and you would make sure that they hang in there because then when they calm down and then they make the decision of like, I'm going to stay in here for 20 more seconds or whatever it is. And then I'm going to either let myself out or I'm going to engage in the conversation that I have to have with the therapist in order for them to let me out. Then you've done it. But if you bail them out by opening that closet door, all you have done as a therapist, is you have engaged them in avoidance. You have made you have made them escape. And as a result, they have not built their distress tolerance. And so what that means is that, and this is an important point before I do this last point, what this means is that if you're in a relationship, and this particularly applies to parent-child relationships because as children are building distress tolerance, parental distress tolerance is on the hook. 
the therapist in that moment has to have a high distress tolerance for anxiety because of course that would make me anxious to be the reason that a person is sitting. Well, I'm not the reason they got in the closet, but that I'm the person that is sitting there with them while they are anxious and they are agonizing and they're feeling awful. And if I have a low distress tolerance for watching somebody else struggle with anxiety, I'm going to bail them out. And this is the issue that we see happening right now with parents and children, which is where parents right now have this idea that their children have to be okay and comfortable all the time. And so what happens is your child falls and they scrape their knee, and of course it hurts. Of course it hurts. Potentially the worst pain they ever felt. And of course it's horrible, and and you don't want them to be uncomfortable. But if you let them be uncomfortable for a little bit, and you can show that you're there, but that it's okay that it hurts, and then help the child maybe problem solve that. Hey, what do you think we should do? Do you think we should go like? And they say maybe we should go get a band aid. Great, let's go get a band aid, and you can and go and you go problem solve while it hurts. It's a big deal. If a kid's doing their homework assignment and they're experiencing anxiety because they just can't quite get the multiplication down, and a parent's Distress tolerance is super low, and they just can't handle how much that their kid is struggling with the homework. And then they end up just like doing the homework for the kid. Or they say, yeah, no, you don't have to do it then. You have just put your kid into a space of having lower distress tolerance because you've told that kid that when they're uncomfortable, they can be bailed out of it. And that's not the way real life works. So then you get into the real world where you experience distress and discomfort all the time. And you're screwed because what you've learned throughout your entire life is that you'll be bailed out of that. Oh, I'll just, uh, you know, oh, yeah, I really hated this teacher. So mom and dad pulled me out of that class and put me in another one. And then I hated that teacher. So mom and dad pulled me out and they sent me to another school. And then I didn't really like that school much. So mom and dad pulled me out of that class and they put me in this other teacher. And then I finally got a teacher that I like. That's not how the world works. Do you want your kid to be bullied? Absolutely not. That's not, obviously not. But like if you're, at some point your kid's got to be uncomfortable. At some point your kid has got to learn how to hang in there while they're not feeling great. And you as a parent or you as a person who's in an intimate relationship have got to be able to hang in there with how awful that is. And I say that to parents all the time. I know this sucks. I know watching your kids struggle in school is so hard. And I'm here to support you and how hard that is. You've got to let them be uncomfortable. You've got to help them do some problem solving while they're uncomfortable and just show them that it's okay to be uncomfortable. Okay. So the final part about what do we do? I want to make sure I do this part because this is really important. What do you do? This is a skill that you've got to build. And here's the metaphor that I'm going to use before I show you how this works on the chart. Think about distress tolerance as exercise. And specifically, think about it for a second as if it's push-ups. Bye, Victoria. So I remember when I was a freshman in college, I had never really worked out much in my life. And I decided that one of the ways that I was going to start to at least try to attend to my physical health was that before I went to bed at night, I was going to do push-ups. And I was going to see how many I could do. And so what I would do is I'd do as many push-ups as I could normal, and then I would drop down and then put my knees down and then do as many push-ups on my knees as I could. And I would try to do three sets of that. Well, for anybody who's in here who knows how strength training works, yes, Kissa, that when you go to lift and you want to lift more weights or you want to be able to do more push-ups, 
the way that you build muscle is you first have to tear your muscles, not in a serious way, but you have to put some tears in your muscles and that the real strength being built happens when you push just past your threshold. So think of this in terms of push-ups. So if you're a person with low distress tolerance, you can probably only do maybe 10 push-ups right now. If you're a person with ridiculously high distress tolerance, you may be able to do like 400 push-ups. Maybe the healthy zone of push-ups for what you need is somewhere between, say, 75 and 100. If you could do 75 to 100 push-ups, that's cool. But relative to the situation, if you're on an incline, right, if you're cold, if you're sick, that's where the context comes in, right? So if you're doing, if your distress tolerance right now is 11, is 10 push-ups, basically meaning that you go up and down, you get stressed, and then you really start to feel the pain. And then you're at that moment, and I'm sure every single one of you has been in this moment. You're in this moment where you think, I can't do this anymore. I can't handle this anxiety anymore. I can't handle this sadness. I can't do this. This is too painful. So I need to get out, right? That moment sucks, Kimby. Absolutely. I hate that moment as much as every single one of you hate, hates it, but we all have it. And for every single one of us that comes at a different moment because of our relative distress tolerance. In that moment, the way that you, tr truly, this is how you do it. The way you build distress tolerance is in that moment, you do one more push-up or two more if you can manage to do it. It does not mean that you can't escape. A common thing that people will say to me is, well, what, so I'm supposed to just stay in there? I'm supposed to just feel like shit forever? Like, no. If you need to, because at some point I got to stop doing push-ups, right? But if I could do, if I get to 20 and I'm hating it and I'm like, oh my God, this hurts so bad. I can't do it. And you go, no, one more. And you go down and you do it and then you push up and you see yourself do the 21st push-up. And then you stop because that's really your threshold. You can look back on it and go, you know what? I thought I was only going to be able to do 20 push-ups. I did 21. And when I was a freshman in college, I was amazed that like a week later, every, every night I could do like one or two more. Like I would go until I, until I couldn't do it anymore. And eventually I got to a point, like when I started, I could only do like 15 and 10. And I got to a point where I could do like 65 and 30. And yes, you don't try to hurt yourself, right? You don't try to lift 300 pounds after you've only been lifting 15. But you just, it's these incremental bits. So emotionally, the way that this looks is I experience anxiety. I experience it as distressing. Normally what I would do is engage in some reassurance seeking. I would go ask my partner, do you still love me? And what I as a therapist would do is I'd say, you know what? Let's hang in there for just another minute before you do that. You want to do it. And usually sometimes you get where people are literally rocking back and forth because they are in so much emotional pain, like where they were literally, literally be like just and like they can't handle it and it's horrible and it feels awful. And you're, and this is where it's so helpful to have a therapist. This is why I think people need to have a therapist. If you're building this, especially if you're really going to start doing the work or somebody that you trust is where you're sitting there and you're like, I just, I need to ask. I need to, I need to know that my partner's not cheating on me. I need to know. I ha like, I have to ask, right? Like, and you can just see it. And then what I would do is I go, and I know you're really anxious. Hang in there. You're doing a really good job. I know you want to ask. I know you want to ask him. 
And you're only going to do that if it feels like it's your decision to do it. Because when you're in that moment, asking for reassurance feels like a compulsion. It feels like something you have to do. And so if we go back to what I was talking about a little while ago, which is this needs to be a choice. You need to be able to see yourself as having a decision about what you want to do, not what you have to do. That if we can hang in there for a little bit and you've got my help, I, it could be a minute, it could be five minutes. I mean, it could be whatever it is. But Jinx, honestly, if you can hang in there for 30 seconds longer than you might normally do it, that's already a win. Like, okay, you're anxious. You really want to do it. It feels like you have to. It feels like you have to. And then I might be doing some of the grounding stuff. And then I would say, okay, do you want to? They go, yes, I obviously I want to. Like, no, 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 no. And it still sounds like you have to. And what, you, what people don't realize is while you're working with them and you're engaging their cognitions, they're hanging in there. So I start asking all these questions. We start doing some problem solving. I start trying to kind of dig my way into your thought process. What are you worried is going to happen? Like all this stuff. And you don't realize that you've been uncomfortable this entire time. And then you watch as people, they don't relax, but they start to, they don't start rocking back and forth anymore. And then you go, what, but what would you like to do? What do you want to do right now? And sometimes they'll say like, I actually, I don't want to ask. Awesome. Or if they calm down and they hang in there, you're like, you did a really good job hanging in there. What do you want to do? You know, no, I, I, I still need to ask you. Go, Great. But you know what? You hung in there for 10 minutes with how awful that felt. Do you realize that? 10 minutes. You felt like complete and utter shit and you hung in there. And so next time you feel this and you rock back and forth, we're going to try and hang in there for another five minutes or whatever it is. Now, can it be done on your own? I knew somebody was going to ask that. I'm really glad that you did, Jinx. Um, yes. However, it's really, really, really hard. Like, really hard. It takes an immense, immense amount of discipline. And it takes a plan. It, I mean, it's really, really hard to do. Which is why I wish that everybody had access to a therapist because truly the ability to hang in there and have somebody help you. Like we learn better when we are in groups and we have somebody scaffolding that process. And so having a therapist there who can really hold you in there and, and be there and support you, but also really make sure that you hold the person in there and don't let them out of that closet. Hang in there. That goes way longer. I mean, you got to have some hella crazy discipline to be able to do that on your own. Which is why even therapists who specialize in working with anxiety go to therapy. It's exactly like a spotter when you're lifting weights. It's exactly right. You can't, over, you can't push your limits as much when you don't have a spotter as you can when you do have a spotter. Right? When you're alone, you have to be conservative with it. You might be able to push just a little bit, and that's fine. But to really, like, if you really want to knock this shit out and you really want to build your distress tolerance, you've got to have a spotter. Because they can also help you if you do push it too much. Right? Like, if you do go too far, they can be there and be like, nope, it's okay. It's okay. Get out. You can ask. It's okay. Because I can reinforce that you hung in there and you took a shot. It's really hard to do that on your own. That makes sense. So really, you know, if you're asking yourself, how do I build the stress tolerance? It's that. Think of it as push-ups. Think of it as, how can I do one more push-up here? I really feel like shit. And I really want to do, and I really want to do one of these things. How can I hang in there for a minute? Really important to do. Now, Lillian, you said, what does this look like for avoidance? Because it can be something I keep up with for so long that it stops looking like an action and starts looking like a personality. Well, that's, that's another area where having a therapist is really helpful because a therapist will be able to see a pattern of avoidance. 
So when I'm working with clients, I can see the times in which they cognitively try to bail out of their emotional experience. And after getting to know them and doing a bit of an assessment, then that's where I can catch and be like, you know what? Nope. Hold on a second. I know you want to go over here. I'm going to bring you back for a second. I want you to keep talking about this. Hang in there. So if you were going to do it on your own, a person would have to really be able to catch when they avoid and then would have to be able to hold in there. And again, if you don't feel like shit while you're building distress tolerance, you are not building distress tolerance. Building distress tolerance sucks. There is no easy way to do it. There is no one-step plan where all you got to do is just rub some lavender on your face and you can handle distress better. It does not work that way. You really, you've got to feel like shit. That's the whole, that's the whole thing of it is in order to build distress tolerance, you have to experience distress. The whole reason that people have low distress tolerance is because they run away from feeling uncomfortable. The TLDR is that distress tolerance, the, the, if we can build a healthy level of distress tolerance where we can tolerate distress, but also be sensitive to our emotional experience, opens the door for us to be able to make decisions about how we talk to ourselves and then how we act, how we show up in relationships and how we interact with ourselves. So a healthy level of distress tolerance is going to allow a person to be able to recognize what their emotional experience is handle it if it's if it's distressing and hang in there with it to a point where they can do what they want to do as opposed to what they feel compelled to do. That's the quick synopsis of kind of how distress tolerance works and the consequences of it. If you have too high of distress tolerance, you won't be sensitive to your emotional experience and things will just kind of fall through you and you might hang in there through dangerous situations that you should get out of. If you are very low on distress tolerance, you will likely try to escape or engage in reassurance or avoidance seeking behaviors that oftentimes make emotional experiences even more jarring and distressing. So you want to have a healthy balance and having somebody like a therapist around to help scaffold that process and help you hang in there when you're distressed is really important because the way we build distress tolerance is to be distressed and to regulate the way in which we experience distress when others are distressed and allowing people to be distressed.